Um, I'm in Windsor, Cheshire. Some of you may know Windsor, I don't know. Um, it's a lovely little town and um, has its problems like everywhere else. Um, we moved up here because of family about five or six years ago. Been a Christian since I was 33. I'm 70 this year. Um, and I can only say the Lord has really helped me through a number of very difficult problems over my life. And uh, to say that, I'm also happy to help anybody who has similar problems, you know, with, uh, you know, family, uh, marriages, family, all kinds of things like that. Um, been through the middle of it. I've even lost a wife in the process some years ago. Uh, so I, I know what it is to uh, uh, struggle and suffer in serving the Lord and in dealing with the things that come at you. So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And uh, I'm ready to start now, Chuck, if that's okay. The, um, so the, the um, talk today is about um, uh, earthly mindedness. It's a, a bit of a report from the email I sent out before and um, a, a partly a devotional towards the end. Um, Firstly, could we just read Titus 2, 11 to 14? Titus 2, 11 to 14. It's one of a few references I'd like to read, but there isn't time to read any more. But they are on the paper. So, Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great god and savior jesus christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good now, um, I've got a couple of references on the paper. One, the book you already, you've already seen is, search, uh, is um, Searching Our Hearts in Difficult Times. Some of you have already mentioned that to me, that you've got that. Um, this one towards the end, Duties, um, duties um, of Christian Fellowship, it's like a manual for church members on a more independent basis. I'll mention that towards the end. And another one on culture, The Hideous Strength, which I would recommend. Uh, uh, towards the end of a bit more as well by um, Melvin Tinker um, and the reason for those I'll mention as I go along the um, definition of worldliness by David Wells now David Wells has written a lot about uh, the modern era postmodern era and about culture from quite a way back from the enlightenment period and he said worldliness is everything in the culture which makes sinning look normal and righteousness look odd to be enculturated is to be worldly. So what he's saying is to be uh, too worldly. Mean, the word enculturated would mean you're too much in the culture, basically. So therefore, that makes culture an important thing to us to look at. Um, Spurgeon said on worldliness, if you profess to be a Christian and yet find full satisfaction in worldly pleasures and pursuits, your profession is false. And don't forget, he uses the word full satisfaction not all not just some satisfaction but you're just looking always to the world that's an interesting quote that he makes now re report is based on an email sent out on the 2nd of january um to william and he uh, uh, it just uh, uh, this he uh, sent that out to everybody and um um the reminder is that owen's concern for the church in his day which was obviously 350 years ago um, he made this quote that's really stuck out to me, earthly mindedness. He said, a love of the world and conformity to the world, which is found among the majority of believers, was one of the church problems, you know, of the day. And the, uh, and the other issues, which we don't need to forget either, is um, obviously lukewarmness and lack of love, which are covered in Revelation uh, chapters two and three, with the churches there. Um, now, in, in reply to one individual here, I said, um, the word is cl world's clearly all around us, but the Lord knows um, the Lord knows this, and 
And, and our struggle is to demonstrate our desire both to know him and serve him. So we're both to know him and serve him. My concern is to root out and expose how we can best encourage each other and the church on this journey, no matter which where we are, no where we're at. Um, along with also local ministry, of course. I'm not trying to usurp anyone's local ministry. I'm just trying to say that as believers, we want to be um, encouraged on that journey. Um, though I haven't mentioned it here, um, obviously Pilgrim's Progress is a great, I found that a great help. So perhaps that's a good thing to have a look at from time to time on your spiritual journey. And this book, The Hideous Strength, is something that I would certainly encourage people to read in terms of getting to know your culture and what is going on in the world around us. It really opened my eyes. Um, I hope it might help others who haven't read it yet, and those that have will probably uh, give their comments at the end. Um, so in that sense, um, we are uh, primed for what, we, what happened next. Um, basically, the inquiry I put out about earthly mindedness came back with about seven responses, uh, without my own comments, of course. Uh, one, I, I've picked out a few um, uh, sound bites from those uh, emails just to share with you. Uh, I'm just going to run through them, probably with very little comment, but they, they make themselves quite clear. The first one is the Bible is clear that true saving faith is shown by evidence, proven, proven genuine by observable fruit. OK, there's no biblical references here, just comments. Many in the church, the second one, many in the church are far too worldly one foot in the church and one foot in the world, meaning desires too comfortable, perhaps asleep. Um, the third one is worldliness pollutes us all to a greater or lesser degree. We're more concerned with the here and now than the hereafter. We're too afraid to speak of the things of God and salvation for fear of being ridiculed. Wanting to be accepted by men more than hoping for the well done, good and faithful servant at the end. The fourth comment was um, very helpful as well. It's a struggle to be in the world, but not of the world. I think we could all uh, agree with that. And then there's some key points there. Um, again, just brevity. What is acceptable? You know, what, what should our behaviour be like? What should we do? What can't we do? Uh, and we don't want to get too legalistic about the way we live, but we want to be moderate and balanced, I would say to that. How to live with family, non-believers. We need great patience and love, of course. How to find the balance. Um, again, that comes with time and experience and listening to the ministry in your church and your pastor and your elders. How to convey to non-Christians, friends and family, how to present the gospel to them. At times, it all feels like a non-stop battle. And I think we can all subscribe to that. The fifth point is the opening verses of Hosea 6, uh, recalled from last week where um, John mentioned that. Um, and it, it's a favourite with us all. Um, but the chapter division is artificial and the meat is in chapter 5. But why does worldliness flourish? Because my people like it to be so. So in a sense, we are. Uh, it, it, the scriptures are telling us that we, unfortunately, like the world too much. The sixth point, if the problem for the church in these difficult times is worldly mindedness, then God has a special way of dealing with us. He writes in his word, Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. We need to rediscover Jesus. Jesus doesn't need our love, but I believe he wants our heart love and greatly values it. I think it's a really helpful comment, that. The seventh point is doer of the word. Now, Mary was a listener and Martha was too busy. That's from Luke 10. The starting point is to ask God, search his word, and then put these things into practice. It's not just the absence of worldliness that we need, but the presence and practice of godliness on our lives. Missionaries are a great example of self-denial. We should do more with what we have. And where are the Daniels? That's a challenging question. With God, all things are possible. And that's the final comment from the returns I got uh, just to rush on quickly now on the positive note though perhaps a kind of sharing our hearts may go some way to helping us all and that was one of the comments that I didn't mention there because it was more a positive 
thing for us as a group. Um, the kind of sharing our hearts, this kind of thing, doing an inquiry like this on something we all feel important about uh, is helpful. So I've put here potential future inquiries might be what do we think about mobile phones and applications? You know, that's a big thing today, isn't it, in the world? And we use them. And no one mentioned these things. Um, modern songs and music. Oh, do we have issues with that? Should we talk about that? Um, the culture and lifestyle things that result from this brief, brief uh, report and devotion. Um, perhaps we should talk about that a little bit more based on the maybe the book by Melvin Tinkler. There are things that we can perhaps gain from that. Now, all I'm going to do now is just quickly uh, sum up a couple of things. Firstly, um, in the book, Duties of Christian Fellowship, again, which is referenced, um, I've had an addendum to this report, which explains what all the rules are in here. Okay. I'm just going to go to the last one, rule 15. And I'm just going to read what the rule is. And it's in relation to the scripture reading we had earlier, which is one of the scripture readings in here. And it says under rule 15, believers should live and walk in an exemplary way in all holiness and godliness to the glory of the gospel, the edification of the church and the conviction of those outside the church. Um, so that's one of the rules. And then he further goes on to give references. He goes on to give an explanation of what he means by that in each and every case. And then after that, he gives some questions for consideration and discussion. So this could be very useful from a group point of view, perhaps another kind of meeting we might decide on. Um, it would be very useful in churches and in fellowship groups. So this can be used as a little bit of a study guide, but it's actually very helpful to any, it doesn't matter what denomination you are, this is a biblical understanding of, of, of our duties uh, as a Christian, and it's geared to an independent view of church, not an institutional church basis. Um, the, the thing is, um, obviously with all these things, we need to read them to benefit from them. Now, two people, just to finish off with, two people mentioned uh, a hymn recently. So I thought I'd just end with reading one of the verses out of that hymn and a verse out of another hymn, and that, and that will be me finished. Now, the first one is, turn your eyes on Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Now, we all know that hymn, but just read it slowly and think about that saying in, 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 in support of what we're talking about, worldliness. In the things of earth will grow strangely dim when we look at him. And the second one is from, O Christ in thee my soul has found. And it's the last verse in that to him. The pleasures lost I sadly mourned, but never wept for thee. Till grace and sightless eyes receive thy loveliness to see. No wonderful verse looking at the Lord Jesus Christ again. Both of you know, these old hymns are so wonderful when we think about the deeper things of our relationship with Christ. And, and I love them really, personally, and I know my wife does as well, Jenny. Um, so I hope you find that helpful. Um, William's got the paper if you want it, and it does include um, a list of all the rules in that um, reference, and it includes reference to the three sources that I mentioned earlier and there's a couple of other bits and pieces on there as well.